Okay, we're going to do a short introduction uh, about our, our chapter in Spanish, and then we'll um, go back to um, the presentation in English. And um, eh, para los que nos acompañan uh, hispanohablantes hoy, recuerden que tenemos un canal de interpretación, de manera que cuando comencemos la parte en inglés, pueden escoger en la barra abajo del Zoom um, conectarse a la interpretación en español. Esta charla está presentada eh, por el capítulo de hispanohablantes de la Sociedad Acústica Americana. Eh, nuestro, nuestra misión es congregar y conectar a los profesionales y estudiantes de la acústica y el sonido, principalmente en el área de Latinoamérica. Sin embargo, tenemos miembros eh, por todo el mundo. Como pueden ver aquí, este es uno de los estatus más recientes de nuestra membresía. Ya pasamos de 300 miembros regados por, por todo el mundo, especialmente en el continente americano, en Colombia, México y Estados Unidos, que son los países con, con más miembros en este momento. La mayoría de nuestros miembros eh, reportan como sus áreas de especialidad la acústica arquitectónica, ingeniería y ruido. Sin embargo, nos gusta traer presentaciones como la que vamos a tener hoy de áreas de la acústica que nos son menos familiares y que nos permiten aprender algo y, y expandir esos horizontes técnicos. Eh, para unirse al capítulo, eh, pueden hacerlo a través de nuestra página web o utilizar este link. Y también siempre estamos abiertos para recibir más personas que quieran hacer parte de la junta directiva y ayudarnos a preparar los eventos. Eh, no tienen que ser miembros de la ASA para ser miembros del capítulo, sin embargo, eh, los invitamos a todos a ser parte también de la ASA. Hay una categoría especial con un muy buen descuento para personas que están en países en vía de desarrollo y para estudiantes. De lo contrario, las eh, categorías de, de miembro y miembro asociado, pues las, las ven también ahí en, en la lista. Esta es la junta directiva actual. Eh, como ven, pues tenemos una, una representación muy buena. Tenemos miembros en, en, en Bolivia, Chile, México, Argentina, Brasil, Colombia. Tenemos eh, actividad en todas las redes sociales, principalmente en YouTube, donde pueden encontrar las grabaciones de todos los eventos anteriores y pueden comunicarse con nosotros eh, a través de las redes de Facebook y de LinkedIn, donde anunciamos los eventos y normalmente les avisamos cuando la grabación ya está lista. Ok, so we have today uh, Dr. Peggy Nelson. Um, it is an immense pleasure for me to introduce her. Uh, we've known each other for about 17 years now since I started being a member of the Acoustical Society America and we found a common interest in um, what happens in classrooms. My interest was from architectural acoustics of classrooms, and her interest was from the communication that happens in those classrooms for people with uh, hearing impairments, for people who are in the stages of learning a new language or just learning for, for little kids. So today she's gonna bring a topic um, about emerging trends in devices for persons with hearing loss. And um, she's currently a professor at the University of Minnesota, uh, as well as uh, associate dean for social sciences in the College of Liberal Arts. Uh, she has been an active researcher. She has been involved with uh, trying to bring uh, hearing loss um, uh, help and, and recognition. So we welcome him today, and, and I think we're going to learn a lot. Thank you, Peggy. I'll give it now to you. Thank you, Anna, and I hope that you'll stop me if I can be more clear, if I can help answer any questions as we go, and I'll uh, see if I get my slides up here now. All right. Thank you all very much for having me, and I hope to um, give you some enthusiasm about my latest area of research that, and I'm going to present this as if I'm presenting to anyone with some experience with some acoustics who has perhaps a family interest or friends or a personal interest in what happens as we get, get hearing loss. So many of us as we age will acquire hearing loss. 
we all have questions about what devices there are, what good do they do? What can we do better? What can we do for our mothers and our grandfathers? And I hope this will help answer some of those questions. There's a lot going on in the United States now. We're in what I'm calling the wild west of hearing devices. And so a lot of us who know something about acoustics can really help guide people through. And I hope to give you some links of, of ways that you can find information after this uh, uh, talk is over and you can ask me questions at any time. My email will be there at the end. Let's see if I can get my cursor set up. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about more than just hearing aids, but I thought I would start here with an introduction to what we call the big five hearing aid manufacturers in the world. Um, and you might look at this picture and say there's more than five things on the screen right now, and you would be correct. But um, some of these companies have merged into becoming one even larger worldwide company. We have the Asignia Widex that are together in one, Oticon, Resound, Starkey, and Phonak. And most of them are housed in Europe, but uh, Starkey is a US company and most of them have offices all around the world. So those are the big five people who are making up the majority of the hearing aid sales in the world. But since the US Food and Drug Administration and the EU is following suit, they have opened up the floodgates. They've opened up the doors to startups and other companies who can get involved in building devices for persons with hearing loss. It used to be if you were some sort of consumer electronics company or a, a small company of some kind, and you thought you could build your own hearing aid, that the US Food and Drug Administration and the EU regulate, regulation would prevent you from selling anything that was meant to help people with hearing loss. Now we have a new world. The, um, the doors are open and there are more people involved in developing things. And so perhaps it's something that you might be interested in as well. So we have some 200 plus startup companies who are involved now in developing devices for persons with hearing loss. And just to get us started, um, there's several links that will be here that you'll be able to get. And I can um, definitely get the slides as well. Um, where you can get information from a business journal called Forbes in the United States, from the National Institute of Health here in the U.S., the National Council on Aging, and especially I recommend this one called Hearing Tracker, and I'll be playing some samples from Hearing Tracker. This is a, a group, a nonpartisan group, if you will, a non um picky about which company it is group uh, who are evaluating different hearing devices. And I think you'll find the, them to be very helpful. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about hearing loss. We're gonna be talking about sensory neural hearing loss. And sensory neural hearing loss just means it's a permanent loss. There is no other medical treatment for it. You will not be able to benefit from medication or surgery or any other types of therapy. Uh, and that's a good <clears throat> vast majority of the hearing loss that happens um, in our lives. So many of us will experience sensory neural hearing loss as we get older. And perhaps you wanna check your own parents and grandparents to see if you might be one who's gonna tend to lose your hearing as you get older because we do have a genetic, it runs in the family. You either have tough ears or you have wimpy ears and your ears will be susceptible to damage for things that you're exposed to through your lifetime. Um, we'll talk a bit more about it, but mostly those causes of sensory neural hearing loss are loud noise exposure, aging, illness, exposure to drugs, and uh, um, things that we get involved with in our lifetimes. The older we get, we've experienced more of them. In the United States now, we have an open, a new opening. There are two classes of hearing aids that are allowable now in the United States. And the first is called prescribed hearing aids that are fit by a specialist. They're fit by someone in training. We've got an audiologist in the US, hearing device dispenser specialist, but who's licensed. Um, there are other kinds of licenses around the world, but someone who is a professional 
hearing health care provider. And those prescribed hearing aids are going to be based on the audiogram. We'll look at some audiograms in a bit, but they are going to be a plot of the quietest sound that a person can hear over the range of frequencies in human hearing. So we're going to plot the quietest sounds that we can hear. We're going to then provide gain or power to those frequencies that are fit based on target values for your hearing loss. And we're going to verify that gain in the ear. It's going to be validated by the person. It's going to be tested well in a professional office, and it's going to be fit according to some international norms prescribed. But now we have the ability to do over-the-counter hearing aids. That is, you can go to a shop like Best Buy or Walmart or one of the um, Walgreens, different stores, and you can do shop on the internet where you can buy over-the-counter or OTC hearing aids. And these have been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. That's the FDA on the slide. The Food and Drug Administration, they've been tested, they've been certified so that they have a certain level of quality there, but they're purchased by the user directly. There's no professional involved. Therefore, it's based not on the audiogram, but it's based on the self-perception that I, as an older person or as a person who recently had an illness or recently had bad noise exposure, I perceive that I have a mild to moderate hearing loss. And the gain then is not fit by the professional, but the gain is adjusted by the user. Now, there are some values that are set by the Food and Drug Administration, like a certain maximum that can't go beyond a certain maximum in the ear, but everything else is open to the user and the user can set these things. And then the performance is validated, evaluated by the user as well. There's no professional involved who can say that this is working well or this is not working well. So it's all user guided. So right away, what do you think? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's both. I think, and it's really turned my own perceptions of the field and my own opinions about what we should do on, on their head. I've, I've flipped the way I teach classes about hearing aids because of the work that we've done in these self-fit over-the-counter hearing aids that can actually work pretty well for quite a few people. So there are other kinds of amplifiers and, and probably many of you who are listening, watching this are familiar with lots of other kinds of amplifiers. There are very inexpensive personal sound amplification products. You can buy them discount stores you have been able to forever. They've been for sale at the back of magazines on the airplanes and things like that. You can buy those. They're marketed though for things like bird watching or listening to what your, your neighbor might be up to and what they're doing. Uh, so they're not for um, hearing loss. And some of them are absolutely terrible, really, really cheap and really, really terrible. And you can get your money's worth. You can bet that what you get is your money's worth for those things. But there are some other assistive technologies. They're specific to people with hearing loss. Anna mentioned classrooms. There are some specific amplifiers that people can use in a classroom, in a movie theater, in a live theater, in a performance venue. You can you have other devices that manage things like your telephone, the response of your telephone headset or your smoke alarm. So there are a lot of other assistive devices that I won't really talk much about, but I would ha be happy to answer questions about. Um, there are other streaming devices. So now your, your phone probably streams everything that you can get from the radio, their television. You can get all these streaming devices and we're gonna incorporate those into some hearing aids. And then there are just other things that with this new made up word called earables where your earbuds might be able to give you some benefit um, when you're, you're, you've got some enhancement things. But we're not gonna talk many, much about these things though I would be happy to answer questions if you want to. So all of these are based on a digital platform. It's very hard to find an analog amplifier anymore. They're based on a digital platform and they're all based in, the, in a simple kind of flow chart. Or the microphone that's going to pick up the sound, 
going to do some filtering. And so to go into a small number of frequency bands or a large number of frequency bands are all in one frequency band. There's some ad adaptive compression just to keep things from clipping. Then you're going to have the chip and the processor and the, dis the uh, digital signal processing that's going to happen. And this is where, this is a stage at where a company is going to distinguish itself. The, the differences between this manufacturer and that manufacturer are going to be within the digital signal processing realm, not in the speaker, which we also call a receiver, or in the microphone, but in this middle stage. And then also there will be some uh, arrangement for power because uh, they're so we want them to be so small that we have to think about how we're going to get power to these things as well. The most common form for those elements to be fit into a hearing device, a wearable hearing device, is in something that hooks over your ear. We call it a behind the ear form that would have this ear hook, then that would have the receiver, the microphones, the signal processor on a switch in here, on a chip in here, and the, and the power there. And then this behind the ear type, most common all over the world, would hang right behind your ear and either have a little one size fits all sort of piece. And in fact, the receiver might be down in this piece that fits down in the ear canal or a plastic kind of ear mold that's gonna fit to the person. But basically all of the processing that we saw on the previous slide is gonna be built into this very small size. And in fact, if we look at this more complex flow chart that's gonna try to distinguish low end from high end devices, you can see that there's a lot that needs to happen on that small chip. And we still have some restrictions of both power and the chip processing speed that allows us to either do more of this processing or less. And as chips get better, the processing will get better. So you can see in this side that moves again from left to right, the sound comes in here to the digital microphone and will eventually come out here into the ear canal. You'll find that we could have multiple microphones on the same small hearing device. So we're building multiple microphones into even a really small form factor. We can use the information from those microphones to try to do some automatic classification of sounds. So is that noise? Was it speech? Was it music? Is it something that I should ignore or is it something that I should pay attention to? So we'll classify the, the sound that we hear and we'll apply different amounts of gain depending on that or we'll apply a different algorithm depending on that. Also, we can have some wireless connection between two hearing aids. We almost all high-end good quality hearing aids will have some feedback cancellation, feedback being that sound of the squeal that you get out of uh, hearing devices. If you sit next to your grandmother, their hearing aids might be squealing and we wanna get rid of that. And basically all modern hearing aids should get rid of that. There's usually a filter bank now. So we're gonna divide the spectrum of sound into multiple frequency regions and we're gonna apply processing to different frequency regions depending on what we want. There'll be some active noise reduction that might be very, um, very effective for some situations. Then we might have some dynamic uh, intensity calibration, amplitude compression, so that we've got different frequency regions with different dynamic ranges. And then as we synthesize the sound back, we reverse the filter bank and we send the sound down the ear. So the more of these high-end features are present in the hearing device, typically the more expensive the device is going to be. And one of the problems that we have as audiologists, I'm an audiologist, have been an audiologist, is that we don't always get our money's worth out of these features. These features that are available in more expensive devices don't benefit everyone. And so we still get the complaints that an expensive hearing aid isn't worth it because the benefit that they get from a little bit of feedback cancellation or a little bit of noise reduction or the current versions of our classifying systems just aren't working well enough to make it worth the price. 
So that's my big uh, research area. What makes it worth it? What would make it worth it if we could do it better? That's what I'm calling this era of my research career. What can we do to make it worth it? There are the same principles that are at play in some of the other devices that I talked about, the um, same microphones, the same filter banks. This is a personal uh, wired device that costs some in the US, some $100, $150 that can be used in hospitals, it can be used in, in nursing homes, it can be used in, in people's homes. There are quite a few people who have a hearing loss, but at home, they don't want to wear hearing aids devices on their ears all day long. And so they might have something like this that's sort of a temporary kind of device that they would use um, for their personal needs, but not all day long. And then there are some other um, sophisticated ways that microphones, receivers, filtering, and all the noise reduction and the feedback reduction are built into some group systems. So those are built into the systems that might be present in the, at the theater or at the movie or something. And they would be, they would have some wireless transmission like an infrared or ultrasound or um, frequency modulated sound system. But they all have the same sort of principles that apply there. Okay, so what do we do? We measure for the prescription hearing aids. We measure an audiogram that probably many of you have seen. We measure on a piece of paper or in a digital form. I still see a lot of us doing this on papers with red pencils. Uh, we measure the quietest sound that a person can hear from low frequencies to high. And across most of the audible spectrum of human hearing, sometimes we will go higher in frequency than 8,000 Hertz because we think there's some interest there. It might be a sign of um, a medical condition or something that we need to, to pay attention to, but we can't really provide amplification above about 8,000, 6,000 or 8,000 Hertz. So we don't do much testing there. And we plot from zero, which would be normal hearing in this range from uh, better than 20 uh, down to 100 dB and more, which would be profound hearing loss. And this hearing loss that is plotted here is one of the most common hearing losses for an older person in um, developed countries that would have mild hearing loss in the low frequencies, dipping to moderate hearing loss in the high frequencies. So we would plot each one of those thresholds. We would plot that for both ears. We would then provide a test device and the devices are largely widely programmable. So we can pick a device and put it on the person and put a probe tube down in the ear canal, inside the ear canal and inside the device, between the device and the eardrum. And we can measure what we'll call the insertion gate. So we'll put the probe tube down in the ear canal and measure without any hearing device on it and measure the sound level of a calibrated broad band sound. Then we'll put the device on and we'll measure how much insertion gain was provided. And what we want to see in a modern device is the gain increasing with the increasing degree of hearing loss. So you can see that there's more hearing loss at 4,000 Hertz than there is at 500 Hertz. So we have more gain at four, in the 4,000 Hertz range than we do at the 500 Hertz range. So we can provide even with fairly simple amplification devices, we can provide this kind of sloping gain where we provide more gain for the high frequencies than we do for the low frequencies. It doesn't take a high priced hearing aid to do that. But what does cost more is this level dependence that you might have noticed on this plot. That is if the input sound is 50 dB, which would be fairly quiet, quiet speech, uh, speech from a, a farther distance away. And we want more insertion gain for those quiet sounds. We want a moderate amount for average sounds, and we don't want much gain for loud sounds. So we have this amplitude dependent gain that we want, we have a target for, 
and we try to measure that. And so we put the probe down and this dotted line might be the actual real response that I got to a 65 dB sound. And I think I've got a pretty good match to target. So what the hearing specialist is going to try to do is match these targets to for 50 dB of gain, 65 dB of gain, and 80 dB of gain. And those targets are based on thousands of users over decades who preferred their gain at those levels. So we, we have something that we're, we're shooting for, something that we're aiming for, and we can tell whether we get close to that target. So I hope you'll hang on to the thought of targets because we'll talk about those as we talk about some of the newer um, hearing devices that we'll be testing. So these, we can fit almost any kind of audiogram. It can be a rising shape, a highly unusual shape. We have some that have a U shape to them. We have some that have an upside down U shape to them. We can fit all kinds of shapes of hearing loss. We'll fit the targets and we'll adjust the gain in the different frequency bands until we get close to those targets for soft, medium, and loud sounds. And that would be the way we would fit a prescription hearing aid. The average price in the United States for a prescribed hearing aid like this is $2,300, $2,400. That's for one. And so for a pair, you can get a low end pair of hearing aids that are fit by prescription for about $2,500 or so it may go up to $8,000. And that price may depend on how many of those advanced features they built in. How, how advanced was the noise reduction? How advanced was the feedback canceling? How advanced is the active um, amplitude compression and how quickly does it work? So we have uh, all of these variables that can go into the price, but you can see that the price is fairly high. And you can understand that I have quite a few people who tell me it's not worth it. Um, and again, we'll talk more about that. There are lots of state laws and there are federal laws and the Food, Food and Drug Administration uh, get involved in, and the person who fits this prescription-based device is licensed to do that. So these days, I say today, but for the last year or so, we have been focusing then on what's new. What about these over-the-counter kinds of devices? What about devices that you could just buy from the store and bring it home and set it up? Well, it took a good, a good decade, maybe more of really hard work by um, some audiology professionals and some legislators and consumers to really get the US Food and Drug Administration to consider allowing over-the-counter sales of hearing devices. And the case was always, we have such poor uptake of hearing aids and we have had for many decades and we do have poor adoption of hearing aids around the world, no matter what the medical model. Hearing aid adoption is remarkably poor. Probably in the United States, about one third of the people who really could benefit and should wear hearing aids are wearing them, maybe a quarter or maybe one third. In the world where there's socialized medicine, we still only get 35 or 40 percent, less than half of the people who really could benefit from hearing devices are using them even when the cost is zero. So there is a lot of barriers and we're working on figuring out those barriers. And cost is certainly one of them. You saw the price on the previous slide. But even when there is socialized medicine such that the cost to the consumer is very small, we still have poor adoption. We do still have the problem in the United States of how accessible the services are. So if your 85 year old grandmother is living in a small town or in a nursing home to pick your grandmother up, to take your grandmother to the professional services to get them cared for, to get the follow-up visits, to get all of the, the care 
and the and the attention that she needs takes a lot of trouble. It makes it makes for a lot of trouble. And probably your 85 year old grandmother is worried about many other things and, and has other health visits and has other professional visits and really doesn't want to go and do these things. There's a shortage of specialists in the United States. I think there's a shortage of specialists around the world. So sometimes there's a long distance that a person has to go. But even just making the appointments, getting the, to the appointment, getting to the follow-up, following all the steps, if there's anything that gets wrong and you need an extra step in there, there's an access problem. We have hoped that we could change some of that, both by reducing the cost and by increasing the accessibility and by reducing the distance for people that they might actually adopt and use over-the-counter hearing devices more than they would the prescription type. Even if the over-the-counter devices are less precise and less individualized and customized to their needs, at least it would be something that perhaps they will use. And even if it's slightly imprecise, the use of something is going to be better than, than other things, than not using anything at all. So there are a lot of inequities in the United States, geographic inequities, minority inequities, people who distrust the healthcare system, people who don't have any kind of health insurance, uh, people who avoid the, um, the medical system especially in North America, uh, those are barriers to the traditional fitting of hearing aids. And there's always still that worth it problem that we still don't have the problem that solved of figuring out what would make it worth it. I have friends and colleagues who can afford hearing aids. They're retired physicians, retired engineers, retired professors but they've never gone to the trouble of spending $4,000 to get a good pair of hearing aids. And when they heard that over-the-counter hearing aids might be available for under $1,000 a pair, they were like, let me go, I'm in, let me have them. I, I wanna try it. And I think you can afford $8,000. Why is the difference that $1,000 is gonna make you try this more? But clearly it is. It's going to be a factor in a lot of people's decisions. They're going to say, yeah, I'm willing to try $900 for a pair. I am not willing to try $6,000 for a pair. And so there's an entry point there that makes this more accessible, if you will, and uh, hopefully more worth it when they come to it. The over-the-counter devices in the United States can only be for adults can only be for people who are 18 years of age or older, um, only for people who say that they perceive they have a mild or a moderate hearing loss, not for a severe and profound hearing loss. That is a subjective thing that we're all gonna have to deal with, but they are now available in many places. They're available physically at stores. I can go walk up to a number of stores and find them in the consumer electronics aisles um, that nobody at the retail place has to be licensed. They don't have to have a medical evaluation of any kind. They don't have to have a prescription or an adjustment by any kind of a hearing health professional, but they must be something that the user can open up, adjust them, control the gain, make volume and frequency dependent changes without the benefit of assistance. And this will be one of our tricks that we're still working on over the past year and that we'll continue to work on. How can we make it really controllable by the user? They also have some uh, required labels. They must have some things about candidacy that state you shouldn't be using this if you don't believe that you have a mild hearing loss, but everybody's just on the honor system for that. There should be some safety warnings. There's some reporting information how where you can go if you think you've uh, received this in error or that you need some help with that. And the Food and Drug Administration generally um, provides a limit of 111 dB sound pressure level, but if it has compression, which almost all of them do, 117. So this can put out enough gain for a person with uh, mild hearing loss, but not enough gain for a person with moderate or severe hearing loss. The FDA also has some 
design requirements. They can't be small enough that a person could actually hurt themselves by pushing it in too far. So they have to be at least 10 millimeters away from the eardrum. They have some regulation about the safe materials for the ear tip. And then they say that they uh, must be clear enough so that the user can open the box and figure out how to get them on their ear. And they have to uh, contain tools, tests, or software that allow the user to control and customize the device. So in most cases, you buy the device and you also buy the app. You, it also includes access to an app that you would put on your phone. So the first thing that you would do when you got home would be to open your phone, go to the website, follow the instructions and download the app onto the device, onto your smartphone. And that will allow you to control the device there. It's another barrier that there has to be in many cases, a smartphone and someone who's capable of uh, doing the pairing of devices and um, of downloading the app and making it work. Okay, so one of the questions that we've had when we started, I started looking at these devices probably, oh gosh, five years more than that ago. And since we all lived through COVID, we know that our sense of time is a mess. So it's probably six or eight years ago that I started looking at these devices. And one of the questions that we had is do we need any kind of a hearing test at all? So I've told you that there are, um, the, the way that it would be prescribed would be to take the results of a hearing test and set the gain according to the test results. But what if we don't know the test result at all? What if we don't have a hearing test at all? And I will say that different companies now are taking a different approach to this question. Some actually include on their app, on your phone, a self-administered hearing test. So they will um, do a hearing test, if you will. And then the answer to that hearing test will help guide that. And some don't do any hearing test at all, no test at all. And you would just start with a, an adjustment of gain. So we have tested one called Ergo where we had them do with the device, either their own clinical audiogram or just the manufacturer's test. And we found in this average response to what the audiogram, what the resulting audiogram was for the clinic versus the, in black versus the ergo algorithm in red, we found them to be very, very similar. So it didn't really make a difference if the person ran the hearing test. And, and I'm, I see a question or two. And so please, Anna, anyone can interrupt me and ask the question live or we'll come back to the questions later on if that's okay. Okay, so again, the question of, should we run a hearing test or no? One of the really interesting studies from 2010 suggested that there are actually 90% of the people who have hearing loss have one of these 10 audiograms. So here you can see the frequency from low to high and the decibels from normal to 100 dB severe loss here. And you can see that one of these 10 audiograms covers 90% of the population of people who have hearing loss. So there are some others but the most of them are very close to this. We call them BizGuard audiograms that was published, um, I think in the IEEE journal in 2010. And if we say that we're not gonna be considering anybody with severe hearing loss anyway, we're only gonna be considering people with mild to moderate hearing losses, there's probably only five or six different shapes of audiograms uh, in, that people are gonna come. So, person could have some, a manufacturer might choose to have some preset gains for each of these kinds of audiograms. And the person could step their way through each of those presets and listen to it and decide which ones were giving them the most benefit. Or they could truly have an open um, set of knobs, if you will, virtual knobs, where you turn up the gain in certain frequencies and turn down the gain in other frequencies, and that you have free reign really to find your own target. And we've evaluated some of, of each of those types. And 
surprisingly to me, people can find their own way. Lots of people can find their own way. So a hearing test might not be necessary, in fact, in order to make these work. The majority of people who are gonna check these out, the majority of people with hearing loss have mild hearing loss. So there are 25 million people with hearing loss in the United States. Majority of those are male, by the way. More than half of those are going to have mild, twice as many people are going to have mild hearing loss as greater than that hearing loss. So of all the people with hearing loss, two thirds of them are gonna be mild. So most of the people who are gonna seek this out are already going to have mild hearing loss. Anyway, let's talk a little bit more about hearing loss. These are some of the typical audiograms that are published that are, are based on age and sex. So let's take a look at the females over here on the right. And you have the different age categories here where if you're age 12 to 30, 39, in fact, your hearing stays very much above this 20 decibel range, very much in the normal hearing region. And you probably wouldn't have any device whatsoever. Then as we females get into our 40s and 50s and 60s, You'll see that we start to lose the very high frequencies, those frequencies nearest six and 8,000 hertz. And by the time we're in the 80s, a typical audiogram for an 80 year old woman would have a mild hearing loss in the low frequencies and a moderate hearing loss in the high frequencies. These, um, these data are from US databases, but they're surprisingly resilient. There seems to be, in fact, a sex protection in females that we tend to get less hearing it, hearing loss when we are female that isn't only explained by our workplaces or our noisy hobbies of shooting guns more often or anything like that. There really seems to be a, a sex effect there that females are more protected from hearing loss than males. And then if we go to the left, we see for males the same age ranges, but you can see that they start to separate younger we see more hearing loss among 20 and 30 year old males than we did among females. And by the time males are 70 and 80 years, we have mild hearing loss in the low frequencies and a severe hearing loss in the higher frequencies. So we do get um, an age and a gender effect. So a lot we can predict just by age and sex. So one thing that apps might do is just ask you, are you do you identify as male or female? And what's your age? And it'll start at a level that would be typical for you based on these demographic tables like this. And then you can do some uh, adjusting like that. I think I mentioned that the most common causes of hearing loss are noise exposure, age, genetics, um, medical conditions, and drugs that we use. And I would, I'm just throwing out here something that people ask me all the time. Aren't young people's ears getting worse than our old people's ears because they have earbuds in all the time? And the answer is no. Contrary to what seems to be believed by the public, young people's hearing is not worse now than it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 50 years ago. In fact, we seem to on average be hearing better than the generation before us and so here you have women on the left and men on the right. Oh, I see this slide, this uh, age group didn't come through very well, but you can tell that the blue, the hearing, the percentage of people with hearing loss in the around 2000 is blue and the percentage of people with hearing loss in around 2015 to 20 is red. And those are actually going down with time for women and for men there are fewer women and men with hearing loss than there were 20 years ago. So we don't think that we're actually causing a great deal of damage. This trend is probably because there are fewer people working in very noisy factories and military situations. So there probably are fewer people exposed to extremely high levels of noise. And so there we don't have as many people with hearing loss in general. A little known fact you can share with your friends. Hearing is getting better, not worse. Okay, so with these new devices, 
we said we might not even get an audiogram. We might not fit them based on an audiogram. We're going to fit them instead on their self-perception. So we need to have good ways to have people ask themselves whether they're having a hearing problem and whether a hearing device might help them. And we're involved a lot in developing those kinds of self-perception measures. And we're also trying to involve family members, uh, friends and family members to help understand the need for hearing loss. So there are a number of very good questionnaires that have been normed that are, uh, that are available in the public domain that can help people understand whether they might need a hearing device, even when they think they don't. And in our work, we would encourage also that the family be involved. It's often the family members that notice first. They notice what the person with hearing loss missed around the dinner table. They notice when the person didn't hear the turn signal in their car. They noticed when the microwave was beeping and the person didn't hear the microwave beeping. So the family member often notices first. So we very much um, will try to involve the family in these decisions, but we ask them very functional questions like this one. Does a hearing problem cause you to feel frustrated when talking with members of a family? And the answers are simple, yes, sometimes, and no. Do you have difficulty hearing when someone whispers to you? Do you feel handicapped by your hearing problem? Does it cause you difficulty when you're visiting? So does it restrict you uh, when you go to, out to do things? Does a hearing problem cause you to miss some of the services or clubs that you want to do? And, some, and importantly, does the hearing problem cause you to have arguments with your family members? So they're very functional questions that we can ask people, perhaps instead of an audiogram at the beginning of this journey that we're going on to see if they answer yes or sometimes to these questions that a hearing device might actually help. An important part of the equation is once the device is on and being used, would everyone say that the device is helping to solve those problems? One of the things that I've run into when I involve the family members in the identification and um, facilitation of adapting to hearing aids is that the family members hope that as soon as you get a new hearing aid, I can forget hearing, forgetting, uh, paying attention to your hearing loss at all. You, grandma, put on your hearing aids and nothing else has to change. Just wear your hearing aids and we'll be just as noisy as we ever would and we'll be just as, as uh, boisterous and we'll be running around and the hearing aids won't solve every problem. The families still need to adopt and adapt their behaviors to the person wearing hearing aids, but hopefully the hearing aids make a difference in their quality of life and that will keep grandma very well engaged in the family life from then on because social isolation is one of our big problems. We also have developed some surveys that might pop up on their smartphone um, while they're, they're, app, they're wearing the app from the various companies that they're on and it'll pop up a question. Are you in a noisy room right now? How's it working? And they'll give a rating on the phone. And these, we call those ecological momentary assessments. They're just things that pop up in the wild when the person is out, uh, out and about. And we find that we can use those little surveys to complement and help people adjust to the um, over-the-counter hearing devices. We can make suggestions like, ah, oh, if you say it's not working, why don't you try turning down the the volume or turning up the noise reduction or something like that. We can make suggestions to the person out in the wild. So we think that we'll be developing some new ways to actually evaluate the success of the systems out in the world, rather than evaluating the success of the system in an audiology booth. We've got a quiet booth. We can do careful measurements. We can do those probe tube targets and we can measure match to target. But if that doesn't result in a daily life change, then we haven't really accomplished our goals. So we want to do some of these tests in the wild to, to see if the devices are doing what they say they will. Um, so what kind of data do we have? 
We've been studying this, as I said, for six or eight years, and we have studied well more than 100 participants with hearing loss. We've used multiple types of the hearing aids, the devices we've on different platforms. And out of the 150 or more users who came and did the test with us, there were only a couple who really couldn't do the adjustments. There Now, we need to remember that the people who volunteered to come in for a study are probably very careful and qualified and capable people. So that doesn't mean that everyone who is in a nursing home or everyone's grandma is going to be able to adapt to this, but that a vast majority of people are going to be able to adapt and use these platforms. There were very few who couldn't adjust the parameters and they would go back to the same parameters, no matter what the sound was. So they definitely had some personal preferences. They really knew what they wanted and when they got it, they liked it and they left it there and they kept it that way. And that was um, a very important thing for us to notice. This was interesting to us. I hope I can get you through this slide. This is how many dB did we deviate from the target? Remember the target that we try to hit when we're in a prescriptive form. So we just gave them the over-the-counter type and they deviated from target, sometimes by 10 dB. But this is their satisfaction score. So was the deviation from the target really related to their satisfaction? No. If their deviation from the target was related to satisfaction, we should see high, this would be a, a good score, high satisfaction and no deviation and a bad score with high deviation. But instead we get this wide range of people who deviated from the target, but are still very satisfied with their devices. So the target we are learning that we use in prescription is also not necessarily going to predict their satisfaction when they're out in the wild. Another reason why the audiogram might be a careful, but not necessarily fully relevant measure for hearing function. Well, one of the big challenges is going to be, can uh, users figure out what to do when they open a box? Can they get a box from the internet? What, are they gonna be able to put the earpiece on? Are, are they gonna figure out which size they need to be? Are they gonna be able to uh, load the app and figure out how to use the app and change the hearing aids? What are the instructions gonna look like? What are the apps gonna look like? And are there going to be specialists, audiology professionals, hearing health professionals, who might, for a small price, just help them get it set up. We don't know. I hope so. I'm hearing that many people are having success with the devices. I don't know what the return rate is yet, but um, big box stores here, the, the Walmart kind of stores will take the hearing aids back if they're purchased there. They'll, they'll allow a return uh, in 48 days, 45 days. So if they can't get it set up, they can at least take it back. I've heard audiologists say they'd be willing for $50 for somebody to stop by and they'll just set it up for them in half an hour. We don't know how some of those service provision um, elements are gonna go. This will be a big, big, big experiment for the next couple of years. So what's available? Well, there's a lot available. I think there's probably 20 um, over-the-counter devices that are on the market now that are in the range of $900 to $1,800 per pair. So less than conventional hearing aids, but not lots and lots and lots less than conventional hearing aids. These are some of the ones that got on the market first and that we have been involved in testing. These were made by Bose. It's now sold by Lexi, but it's still the same hearing aid. Um, I think Sony has its own brand. Um, Jabra um, earpieces now are a part of GN Resound, a hearing aid company, and Lively. They've merged together. There are going to be a lot of mergers and a lot of, of applications. And there are, like we said right at the beginning, more than 200 that are starting up. Not all of those will succeed for sure, but maybe a lot of them will. And uh, consumer interest will really um, determine how many of them stay. And then, of course, uh, people, big companies like Samsung, Apple, 
um, Amazon for, with their Alexa, um, even Meta, Facebook are working on audio algorithms to help enhance the listening system so that you can just wear your own earbuds or have your own computer speakers on and it can be tuned, tunable, so that you get the best kind of, of service that you really want. So I wanted to just give you a little glimpse of hearingtracker.com that is um, a website that is there on the slide. And I don't think I'll go jump out of my slides, but they have a comparison that you can do, a listening comparison that you can do of high quality instruments and low quality instruments. So you can listen, I hope you can hear this. To just someone talking in a cafe and it stops. And you turn this here gate on. Perfect timing. Maybe I can finally get out there and do some yard work. And it sounds like this. My mind went to breaking up the grill. Or it sounds like this. So long as it's going to cut itself. The first one sound like that. The second one sound like that. And I think you can tell that there are some quality differences there. Some are a little more noisy. They give them a rating, a three out of five or a four and a half out of five. So this hearing tracker is going to be a group where people can really go and give, give it a test, give things a test. And they'll have summaries of what the current prices are and um, uh, hopefully give you a good starting point, give consumers a good starting point on what they can what their options are really. So we're in this area that in North America, we're calling a big grand experiment. We've been in this space for about a year. We are figuring out whether people can take them out of the box and use them. We know that many challenges still exist, but we don't know really what the solutions are going to be. We know that people with mild hearing loss have mixed results, mixed mm, impressions of these devices. At first, it doesn't sound so good because they're used to what their hearing loss sounded like and the quality changes. And so they're less interested in really using them for a long period of time. And if they don't use them every day, they're not going to be adapting adequately to the, the devices themselves. We're going to learn more about what retailers can accept returns. We're going to, we think that most people are going to do that so people can actually return them. We're worried what might we be missing when we don't see these people into a professional clinic? Why, might we miss some dizziness or other symptoms that maybe will go undiagnosed? We're wondering as professionals whether these devices People will start there, but eventually they'll end up with a professional so that they might um, uh, find their way to a professional someday. And we're living in this kind of crazy experiment time that I hope you might get involved in and uh, tell your friends and family members about so that we can make the best decisions that we can for people with hearing loss. We've got a lot of questions to answer. We've got a lot of ground to cover. We haven't done well with traditional hearing aids. We've had good quality, but expensive traditional hearing aids for more than 20 years. And we still have this low adoption. Is this gonna help us to reach some people that we don't reach otherwise? That we still don't know yet. So I'm gonna stop soon here and stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna thank you all for listening and putting uh, up with this and uh, for any comments that you might have on the YouTube channel afterwards. I do want to acknowledge that much of the work that I have done at the University of Minnesota has been with grant funding from the National Institutes of Health. Some of the work has been done in collaboration with and support from the manufacturers that we've tested and I would be very glad for anybody to email me at some point and ask any questions. I will stop my sharing and see where we land. All right. Fantastic. I think we learned a lot today and and um, a lot of us might be users someday. So it's I all very we, useful. <laughs> <laughs> it's will, all certainly right. very useful knowledge. Um, 
So we, we do have a question from, from Zachary on, on the Q&A. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that uh, 117 decibels was appropriate for mild hearing loss. So what are the typical output levels for treating moderate to severe hearing loss? Thank you. Thanks for that question. It is more like 125 decibels, and this is sound pressure level, uh, or possibly even as much as 130. So if you think about it this way, I don't know if you noticed, but speech typically runs in 70 to 80 dBSPL, conversational speech that we want to listen to. It's getting loud when we get to 80. If we've got a hearing loss that's like 50 or 60 dB, that that conversational speech is just barely above. So we need 20 or 30 dB of gain. We don't need 60 dB of gain. Even with a 60 dB hearing loss, we only need probably 20 or 30 dB of gain. And so those maximum levels can be in the around 120, 125 for even a more severe loss. They're trying to be more careful. Um, I don't know if anybody knows what your, like your iPods, when, what level they warn you when you get to, I think it's at about 115, but we probably should look that up. 115 is the nice loud sound in your, in your ear canal. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a good, I think, maximum. You also might think about what you're, what you're listening to and most sounds come and go. You know, so your your work environment is louder than it's softer. Your your cafe is louder than it's softer. Music that you listen to is louder and then it's softer. So you're not at a steady, steady, steady 115, but those are the, the maxima that they set for safety. Great. And and after the question, he adds that uh, it was an excellent presentation. I think we all agree about that. Uh, do we have any other questions from attendees today? Um, I, I just wanted to make a comment. I know that um, one of the things that that maybe our, our fields, you know, have in common was finding that people kind of adapt and get used to uh, a bad environment or in this case, a bad physiological condition. And, and maybe one of the reasons people don't go for hearing aids is because they they don't realize how much they could benefit from them. I they need to go way, way beyond the initial need to finally accept that, yes, that, that, would, that would really help. And then, of course, it's been a long time because the hearing loss changes, you know, you saw those decades, it's changing very slowly over the decades. And so if they wait another decade, they've adapted to this inaudible sound. And I had a person explain it to me like this, she said, so I'm going to imitate local hearing loss, it sounds kind of low frequency, you know, it kind of sounds kind of muffled. She would rather listen to that and know that she misses some words than to listen to the high pitched stuff that she gets through her hearing aids and that it's the hearing aids are trouble. So she'd rather live with the limitations that she knows than adapt to some new technology and new constraints that she just isn't familiar with. It's less familiar. So it's more comfortable to stay. So we have to make it good enough to make it worth them to switch over from just be satisfied. I know, I know I miss some things, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna live with it and uh, to adopt something that's new and kind of nervous. And it kind of makes them feel stupid, you know, and, and incapable when you're trying, you know, if you try to pair the app and it just doesn't work and then you get frustrated. Um, there's a lot of those things that are still barriers, but we're gonna give it a try. It takes it takes getting used to, like you said, it's not about switching them on and then it's all perfect and crystal clear. Um, you you need to adapt your your family, people around you need to adapt as well, and and it's a process. Yeah, very nice. Um, well, if we don't have any more questions, we we thank you for being here with us tonight or to today. Um, we uh, hopefully will have. Uh, more viewers in, in the next weeks and uh, we'll be able to tag you for questions or anything so we can continue the conversation um, in, in our social media. Perfect. Uh, 
thanks again and um, join us for our next presentation. Brian, do we have um, anything to share about future calendar? Um, Brian, ¿tenemos eh, futuros eventos eh, anunciados? Ok. Eh, entonces estaremos anunciando los futuros eventos eh, por los medios usuales, por el email y por las redes sociales. Hasta luego.